Today, China produces more scientists than any other country. And many of them are leading their fields. Pushing advances in medicine, robotics, radio astronomy, high energy physics, quantum computing, and cosmology. From reinventing food production, helping to feed almost 8 billion of us, to tackling global diseases, and building a more sustainable society, China is increasingly engaged with today's global challenges. And from deep sea to deep space, they are at the vanguard of human exploration. Their work is not only shaping the future of China, but the future for all of us. And the stories of their scientists are our stories too. Welcome to a new age of Eastern science. Let's turn over. Good morning. Science is the driving force that's changed society the most in the last few centuries. From advances in genetics and biotechnology to computing and communication, our breakthroughs are all driven by one thing, curiosity. This is the story of seven scientists in China who've devoted their lives to being curious in the quest to discover the nature of life chart the oceans, explore worlds beyond Earth, and dive deep into the quantum world and the atom. I think every piece of knowledge is useful. It's just like a building that you have a lot of bricks. You cannot say which brick is important. So we are just trying to contribute to add one more break for the building. My name is Yifan Wan. I'm an explorer of atoms. If you think about the whole history of the science, is actually going deeper to the structure of matter. So we managed to understand the atoms. We managed to understand nuclei. And now we're trying to look at the elementary particles. So it's a step-by-step. Step. The elementary particle physics world is actually made of 12 particles, we call the fermions. And these uh, 12 particles actually made up our whole material world. Among these 12 particles, we have uh, three neutrinos. These neutrinos are the lightest elementary particles and actually uh, play extremely important roles because all the heavier particles in the end can decay into the light of neutrinos. So neutrinos are the most abundant type of particles in the world. Neutrinos are around us everywhere. I mean, the sun is a neutrino source, the earth is a neutrino source, and even human beings are neutrino source. They are around us everywhere in the universe. In every uh, cubic centimeter, there are 300 neutrinos. So it's, it's, it's huge. But neutrinos have very little mass, so uh, neutrinos going through the Earth can easily pass without any interactions. So it's very hard to detect them. Yifang's first neutrino detector built in China at a place called Dia Bay, allowed him to measure an important property of the neutrinos coming from a nearby nuclear power station. It captured headlines around the globe and put China on the world stage of high energy physics. To be honest, this was the first major discovery I ever had in my life. So of course, it's very, very exciting. During the process of the Dia Bay experiment, we realized that you can actually measure another very important physics parameter to understand which neutrino is heavier. Yi Fang's new detector, designed to measure the elusive mass of neutrinos, 
is under construction deep underground in southern China. It's known as the Jiangmen Underground Neutrino Observatory, or Juno for short. And it will eventually be the largest, most sensitive neutrino detector ever built. You have to design your detector with sufficient shielding so that background neutrinos are not coming into your detector. You have to have uh, something like 400 meters of rock above your detector to shield cosmic rays. So we need to dig a sloped tunnel going down because we need a huge underground cavern. The diameter is one of the largest in the world. It's 50 meters. And then in the cavern, we build our neutrino detectors. Underground laboratory is very difficult because we had to control the water out from the rock in a very, very careful way. And the second day, going deep in the ground, the rock temperature increases. Indeed, at our experimental site, the rock temperature is 30 degrees. So this requires a lot of ventilation and heat removal, and this cost is another huge difficulty. Working down here in these conditions for up to 12 hours at a time puts a great stress on the construction team. Already four years into the excavation, the hardest part of Juno is yet to come, building the instrument that will detect and weigh the elusive neutrinos. In addition to the civil construction, the detector itself is uh, unprecedented. In Juno, this is a factor of thousand larger than our diabetes detector. This is the largest ever built in the world. So we have to worry a lot of things which we never uh, thought of. For example, whether it is safe during the earthquake. And all of this, actually, nobody knows how, how to calculate. So we had to figure out from the first principle and calculate all these effects and come up with the design. And we believe it's feasible. Of course, difficult, but uh, the jump, we believe, is achievable. These neutrinos are just one subfield of science. But there's no doubt that we should pursue this kind of pure science related knowledge, maybe to help our world. Our quest for new knowledge spans the planet. From the deep underground exploration of subatomic matter to Earth's deepest oceans. As a scientist, you want to know nature, know the world, know the universe. My name is Wei Chen Cui, and I'm the explorer of oceans. In the oceans, we have too much information about the ocean. 我们现在人类对海底的了解，跟那个月球表面，甚至跟火星表面，我们甚至都不如。为什么那么呃不了解？因为我们没有很好的装备。我们现在要研制的这个彩虹一的载人潜水机，目的是为了帮助科学家反复的下去，呃，反复的勘探。让他们去做海洋科学的研究，让他们来开展这样的工作。海底的地形地貌的数据做到现在给出来的狗狗的地图一样那个清晰的。偏基点控制
Their new submarine, Rainbow Fish, is still being prototyped. But Wei Cheng is confident it can be built. As one of the designers of China's first deep sea submarine, Zhao Long, and one of its crew, he's familiar with the challenges of the deep. So 跟在晚上看到繁星点点这样的感觉是非常像的。然后我们特别要关注的,有什么异常的响声,如果说我听到左前方有什么声音,那这次估计有什么设备可能坏掉了,或者压碎了,压坏了,或者是什么注意。The maximum pressure there is 11 tons per square centimeter. So the pressure uh, the man cabin is very high. 七千米我们大概花了三个半小时。一般都要到潜水机接近海底以后，我们才开始把灯打开。总体上来说还是比较荒凉的他自己就是跟他感觉开可是你这个推力器一转的时候把海底里边的这个阴影就结婚了先换成一个那个小打蛟龙化里边想要改进的就是研制出无人潜水机、着陆机、载人机能够在所有的海洋里边能工作。I dived to 7,000 meters. I wanted to be the few people to reach the 11,000 meters. And there are many other oceans, deepest point, human beings have never been there which I really want to explore myself. Our planet's rich biosphere is underpinned by one extraordinary molecule, the stuff of life, DNA. And its exploration is driving bold advances in biotechnology around the world. As scientists map the genomes of an increasing number of Earth's organisms in a bid to improve them.
this genome editing tools can be a revolutionary technology. It's changing our life. My name is Cai Xiaogao. I'm a plant biologist. So I think quite a lot about how to make a crop improvement. For the past so many years, we use conventional breeding to improve crops. But we could only introduce some traits that are available in parent plants. And it takes also many years to get these desirable traits into the new plants. So now if I compare to that new genome editing tools, genome editing can speed up plant breeding by allowing the introduction of precise DNA sequences in plant genome. CRISPR was invented in 2012 as a new genome editing tool. There are actually two problems to edit uh, plant genomes. The first one, how to cut DNA, and the second one, where to cut. So CRISPR consists of two parts. One is guide-RNA, which match perfect with DNA sequence we are going to cut. And the second, we need to deliver a molecular thesis to make a cut. So the guide RNA will direct this molecular thesis, we also call it Cas9, to the right place and make a very specific carb. We mix those liquids and deliver that to the cells. The guide RNA is floating in the liquid, so we had to find some way to send it into the plant cells. In this case, we chose gold particle. Gold is very heavy, and with this very tiny particle, we could put this guide RNA liquid together with gold particle, and we use high pressure air to push this gold particle into plant cells. So then we need to move this edited cell culture into tissue culture room to let them grow. And once those edited cells grow into seedlings, we need to move them to the greenhouse. And in the end, of the last step, we need to move them to grow the plants in the experimental station. So the benefit of using this genome editing technology, we could uh, develop many new applications. One of TICR's goals is to improve the nutritional value of our food, trialing the technique by creating a new variety of tomato. For tomato project, we are trying to increase vitamin C content. Vitamin C is an important nutrient for humans. So in our project, we take some vegetables and fruits, such as tomato, and we use genome editing technology to increase vitamin C content. Food waste is another problem Taisia and her team are tackling. Using this technology, we are also trying to prolong the shelf life for strawberry by knocking out one gene. So the longer shelf life means also the less waste. It's not just supermarket food waste that Taisia's team are working on. She's also fighting food waste caused by diseases, such as powdery mildew, which decimates wheat crops across the world. The yield decreases by like 30% because of this disease. 
Currently, this disease is controlled by using heavy fungicides, which is not good for environment and which is not good for people's health. So we made a project using genome editing to create a disease-resistant weed. It was very hard, to be honest. Every day when I wake up, the first thing I thought about, what's a new achievement we have got in the experiment? So, yeah, it turned out once we knock out this gene, then we are able to generate a resistant weed plants. So we don't need to spray fungicide anymore. This possibility is so unlimited. The future is unimaginable. Technology usually advances in small steps, but there are fields in science and engineering which are on the brink of making giant leaps that could change the world in dramatic ways. One such field is quantum information, a technology that many countries, including China, are now racing to develop. Our quantum computer system can do something much faster than the state-of-the-art supercomputer. Quantum computer will be a standard tool for all scientists. Our technology could be used for many, many other fields. I am Jiang Wei Pan. My major focus is in the field of quantum physics and quantum information. I would like to give a short example to explain the strangeness of quantum mechanics. So suppose you have two entangled particles, then when they're separated, as long as these two particles are entangled, then this state of one particle will be transmitted to the other one, so it will be a perfect correlation. If you do this in the laboratory, so they are so close, then maybe they have some sort of interaction. But the thing is, the breadth of the distance, they are separate far, far away. And you will see, as long as this particle is in the state of one, then the other one is also in state of one. If this one is in state zero, then the other one will be in state zero, no matter how far away they are separated. So this is a weird scene of quantum mechanics. So people keep asking, why could it be like this? I really want to understand. But whenever you read more, you are more confused. So that's the real problem. In an attempt to better understand quantum entanglement, Jian Wei Pan and his team came up with a bold experiment to see if entangled particles would remain entangled when over a thousand kilometers apart. So the basic idea is we have entangled photon source installed on the satellite. So the satellite will send two entangled photons to two ground stations, which are separated with a distance on the order of 1,000 kilometers. With ground teams waiting at observatories spread out across China, the group held their breath. Our expectation is 99.9% .9 quantum mechanics is still correct but still is 0.01% or something like that. So we want to see some deviation. Then we really find something great. Then people need to re reform the quantum mechanics. With their satellite in position high overhead, the team prepared for their historic experiment. We have to solve lots of problems to make sure the light is always point into your eye from the sky. We have to develop lots of advanced technology so that we can send in the two photons precisely to the two ground stations. Then afterward, we perform measurement on the received single photon. So in our experiment, we managed to show this strange phenomenon over distance 
about uh, 1,207 kilometers. So it's really far away. This is a phenomenon in nature, but we don't know <laughs> why or how this happened. But we are super happy because our technology could be used for future application of quantum communication. And the application Jian Wei Pan and his team chose to attempt was to harness the long distance quantum entanglement they'd observed to create an uncrackable encryption key. So another mission for the satellite, we think we need to use entanglement to encrypt your message, your picture, or your video. So therefore, I mean, in 2017, we managed to ensure the secure information transfer over a distance of 7,600 kilometers between Beijing and Vienna for a video conference between both President of China Academy of Science and the President of Ocean Academy of Science. So you first generate a secret key, then you perform the encryption to send your video message. So he is the only person who can read out this secret message. No one else. And actually, if you have either job, either job is some sort of measurement. So if someone measure in between the content channel, then the state will be changed by the even job. So you know there's someone already performed even dropping on your key. Then you slow away the key. This emerging field of quantum information promises radical changes in society, perhaps eventually powering a revolution in computing as well. In the digital, classic, or modern computer, the basic information element is a bit. So for each bit at a fixed moment, it can only be either in zero state or one state. But however, for a quantum particle, a qubit, then it can have two state memory in the same bit or same qubit simultaneously. But now if we have two quantum bit, they can be in the position of zero, zero, plus one, zero, plus zero, one, plus one, one. Then you already gain a factor of four. So then if you increase the number of qubit, then you really gain enormous computational capacity. By scaling up the potential for doing calculations in this way, with just 50 qubits, you get more possible combinations than there are atoms in the universe. This is precisely the reason why quantum computer can be so powerful. Its computational capacity for some specific task can be, I think, one million times faster than the total computing power over the world today. Of course, it may take 30 years or even 100 years to have a universal quantum computer like we are using today. For the whole quantum technology field, we are still at the early age. But I think the race really already start. One field that could benefit from the complex modeling that quantum computers could excel at in the future is the impact that climate change will have on all of us as we seek solutions to living more sustainably. As the number of people on Earth pushes towards 10 billion, we'll need to produce as much food in the next 30 years as we've done in all of human history. And that will require an altogether different approach to farming. Climate 
我们希望能找到一种新的农业生产的方式。My name is Gong Huaqing, and I'm a farmer. But this is not farming like you might imagine. It's a farm of the future. I'm part of a team that is pioneering a new kind of food production. A production that might one day feed us all. China has to feed one-fifth of world people with just 7% of world arable land. So we try this new experiment. We are attempting to produce more crops in less space. The farm has 10,000 square meters. Where all the environment factors such as lighting, nutrition, humidity, temperature, and the gases all can be controlled to produce quality vegetables. 植物生长它所需要的能源都来自于阳光，所以说光对植物的生长是非常重要的。那这里的话呢，我们就为它们生长不同阶段去设计不同的光谱，来适应它们的生长。比如说在苗期的话呢，植物它需要更多的蓝光。成长的后边的阶段呢，给它多一些的红光，会让它生长的更快。那植物的话呢，它所有一些必须的营养元素，在营养液里必须给它提供。营养液是会不停的循环的。那从某组上面这个营养液呢，依次留下，经过植物的根部。然后逐渐留下，回到这个营养箱内。那这样不断的一个循环过程，可以节省我们在栽培中间水的用量。我的工作呢，主要就是为植物的生长给它配置合适的营养液配方，一些必须的营养元素。如果发生缺乏或不足以及过量的话，都会对植物的生长造成影响，引起植物的失绿啊、发育不良啊这一些的症状。那这个时候的话，我们对营养液就需要进行人工的干预了。那经过几年的辛苦的研究工作呢，我们筛选了超过一千种的蔬菜品种，从中间挑选出一百多种可以适合于目前人工光下边的水培系统。那我们相信，在未来，在植物工厂里边，我们可以生产越来越多的蔬菜。呃，目前这个工厂的话呢，因为还没有完全实现自动化，所以整个工厂大概需要接近五十个人来运行。那其中的话，超过一半的人是集中在蔬菜的采收和包装。如果能在采收和包装的环节再能实现自动化，那我们相信在未来运行这样一个工厂，大概只要一到两个工人就足够了。目前在这一栋工厂里呢，每天可以生产一点八吨的蔬菜，嗯，这个量的话呢，可以供应五千人的蔬菜需求量。根据这个产量，我们可以想象，如果是一栋占地一万平米的一百层的高楼，每一层楼都用这种六层的模组来种植蔬菜，那么总的蔬菜产量可以满足五十万人每天的蔬菜需求量。这种技术可以成为未来我国农业的一个重要组成部分。Beyond this world, human curiosity compels us to peer out into the cosmos, building machines to look further, to see more of the universe than we've ever seen before.
We live in this wonderful, rich and active universe. And as an observer, we want to know more. Our job is to explore the universe, try to find the known unknowns and unknown unknowns. I'm Dili. I'm an explorer of radio waves from the cosmos. Radio astronomy is just this wonderful playground. Because if you look up in the sky, we see the Milky Way, we see the sun, we see many, many stars. On the other hand, most of the cosmic material exists in this so-called dark state, invisible to human eyes. But they emit low-frequency radio waves. We just need the proper eyes or ears to listen to them. And the radio telescope is the instrument to try to catch that low-frequency wave that gives us information of those dark material. This low-frequency radio wave has a wavelength of 21 centimeter, that's roughly the size of a watermelon. But we also know that the universe is expanding, and while it's expanding, that radio wave will be stretched. It will become only 21 centimeter, it will become 30 centimeter, and all the way go to meters and multiple of uh, meters. So as the wavelengths become bigger and bigger, we'll need larger and larger antennas to collect those waves so we can look into more distant universe. That's when radio astronomers worldwide uh, start to come up with this concept for the next big radio telescope. That is like a quantum leap from anything we have now. So as part of that concept, Dr. Ren Dongnan and his colleagues propose that we can build our giant dish called FAST. Dr. Ren Dongnan really drive this project from the very beginning and it will spend basically the later half of his whole life and uh, career of bringing this into fusion. You need an area that is rich of natural depressions, otherwise you have to really blow a lot of holes and that cost can revel the full cost of building the telescope. So then a couple of candidate sites was selected in this area and finally settled on this site. It's really remote. My first time here is in 2007. I uh, came on a trip with Dr. Nan, actually. Many things in FAST has not happened before, so I can certainly feel his pressure. One of the key challenges uh, is the panels. We have 4,500 panels. But they actually made of about 100 smaller panels, about one meter triangle. And they are reassembled on site. And they have to be screwed on precisely and pointed to a point in the sky. So my main concern is to carry out this major surveys. One is aiming for thousands of new pulsars. A radio pulsar is a fast-spinning so-called neutron star, characterized by its amazing properties. For example, its very large density, a billion tons per cubic centimeter, and a very high magnetic field and it's made up of uh, superconducting superfluid. So it's certainly unlike anything that we found on Earth. And discovery of pulsar and the study of them bring to light the fact that such sort of unimaginable material actually exists. So we finished construction toward the end of September of 2016. And afterwards, it's, it's really the nerve-wracking period. <laughs> because we push return and wait for the screen to update. We 
see this short pulse, very bright, that come from distant uh, cosmos. So we know the full system work. After that, we try to find much weaker signals to expand our knowledge and discovery of new pulsars. We got some better data, and we actually see new pulsars. I was really happy, so I sent this message uh, to Dr. Nan. Uh, we have this confirmed discovery. I didn't get a uh, reply because he passed away a, a, a few days uh, after that. I still hope that, uh, that he, he was aware and, and, and I know that deep down in, in his heart, he has confidence in FAST and in his whole life's work. We are poised to double the number of pulsars known, and that's largely thanks to the great sensitivity that this large antenna has given us. We can go much deeper than other telescopes. We have expanded the capability of radio astronomy, and we already start to produce science discoveries. At the end of the day, I just feel lucky and uh, really fortunate that now we can actually measure something that no human being before has measured. Closer to home, there are other worlds to explore. Worlds we might one day also call home. And there's one that China's prioritized most. The moon. Zhongguo My name is Ouyang Ziyuan. I'm explorer of the moon. In 1969, this是人類的一大步,這家阿姆斯特朗講的。是一個人類的偉大的壯舉。我堅信我們中國雖然現在是一窮二白研究陨石最後命名為嫦娥工程
嫦娥是中国人崇拜的月亮神。我们没有能力像美国一样把人送上月球。所以，第一步我们叫无人月球探测。我要对整个月球，我中国第一次去，整体怎么样？全球性的怎么样？它的综合性的有哪些特点？所以我们第一步发射了嫦娥一号、嫦娥二号，它是一个绕月飞行的卫星。China's first mission to the moon. Chang'e One left Earth on the 24th of October 2007, riding a rocket they'd only used before to put satellites into orbit. Some opinions say I'm going to the moon, but I'm afraid our rocket capacity is not good enough. They finally decide to fly the Earth three times. 就好像一个运动员的练球运动员啊，他把那个练球使劲转转转转得非常快，最后一松手，高速的飞去过。在到达月球的时候，我在大厅里面观察，我提心吊胆。这个最关键的时候来了，成败系于这一点上。人家失败就在这一点上。最后，测控向我们报告，已经被月亮抓住了。按理说，这应该是大高兴、非常高兴的事情了。我说不行，你给我再复合一次。孙家栋他是总师，我是首席科学家，我们两个商量决定再核实一次。他们又核实了一次，说已经被月亮抓住了。发动机关机，第一次进月之动结束。我们两个老头，我七十多岁，他八十多岁，抱在一起大哭一场，很激动，不是别的。我不知道说什么，因为太激动了。我们成功了，所以嫦娥一号给了我们极大的激励，充满了信心。第二步，我们要精细探测月球，这样的嫦娥三号、嫦娥四号就是落下去探测。嫦娥三号在月球的正面，嫦娥四号在月球的背面落下去。而你要落在月球背面，只有一个半，我地球上看不见。到了一百米的高空的时候，我们请他自己选一个地方落下去。月球背面没有那么多海洋，平缓的地方都是高山峻岭。我们悬在那儿照相，立即判断不行，你再挪一个地方，他又再挪再挪，最后他自己选了一张落下去，他一。落了地以后，我简直蹦起来了，跳起来了，四条腿搭在一个平面上，太妙了！我们很庆幸啊。Chang'e Four touched down on the far side of the Moon's southern hemisphere in a largely unexplored region, only studied before from orbit. 月球背面谁也没有落下去，表面的环境是这样是那样，但是你没证据。最后落到地方，它叫埃肯盆地，是四十一亿年以前一个小天体砸在月球背面上
砸挖出了一个巨大的盆地，它的直径两千四百八十公里，多大的一个坑啊！它挖出来的四十亿年以前最古老的石头，全部给你剥开了。太妙了！我就要飞到那儿去，就要落下去。月球车就在上面走，走一个地方，车一个地方。哎，月球最古老的历史。嗯、今年我们计划要完成采样返回。嫦娥五号、六号将要把样品带回来。这样的话，我完全有把握把中国的航天员送上月球，开展载人的月、建设月球基地等等的活动。我毫不怀疑。当然，我们比人家阿波罗晚了半个多世纪。但是没关系，我们自己底子差嘛。我们中国就是这样一步一步的走下去的。我也坚信我们中国未来一定能够实现的，并不遥远，是这样的。